Hello, and welcome to the We're Not Stump podcast. I'm your host, Mike Boland, and I'm a congenital amputee of the right hand. In this show, I will interview other amputees and allow them to tell you their incredible life stories. I'll also feature family members of amputees and others who support the amputee community, all in an effort to discuss the challenges and triumphs of those living with limb loss. So stick around and listen to inspirational stories and find out why we say we're not stumped. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to the We're Not Stumped podcast. I'm your host, Mike Bolin, and today I got a special guest, Dr. Eric Gabriel, and he's been on before, but he wanted to come back on, and I can't wait to talk to him. It's going to be fun. He, he gave me notes. I'm ready to dig into this. Eric, thank you so much for taking your time to be on the We're Not Stumped podcast. No, hey, Michael. I'm very honored to be here tonight, and uh, hello to your audience. Uh, I don't want to bore them with uh, heavy details, but what I'd like to talk about tonight is um, I'm a bilateral above knees amputee, uh, and I wasn't born this way. This happened later, and, and I'll tell, tell the audience this. But the crux of my discussion is basically how I had to adapt my body to an environment, and I had to adapt my environment to my new body. And um, so... You can actually describe my life almost like an off-Broadway play. It came in acts. So the the, the first act of my lovely life was, um, and it was the first 50 years of my life, I was an able-bodied individual, had a normal job, drove a car, had a house, um, did everything, I, I say normal, that uh, people do. Uh, The only thing that I I think that was a little bit different in my life at that time was, along with my so-called normal job, I played on a traveling softball team for 18 years. And that is actually opening the door to our discussion tonight. Through those 18 years, I I tossed my body around uh, pretty vigorously. Uh, I was six foot five when I played, uh, 265 pounds. I did a lot of head first slides, uh, ran into walls. Uh, I gave up my body, no cost. And over the 18 years, we averaged about 150 games a uh, season. Wow. That's on top of having a regular job. So there was a lot of travel involved. Um, with that, uh, I developed, I guess, which I've learned in later years, you develop an identity. And I, have an athletic identity. Uh, you know, I'm determined. I set goals. I need motivation. Um, a lot of drive, a lot of effort. And uh, that kept me going through all the years of playing ball. So after, and when I played ball, my, my dad used to come to the games. And after the games, he would say, you know, you're throwing your body around. You're going to pay for this when you get older. And I said, come on, dad. You know, what do dads know, right? What do moms, dad know? They know nothing. And uh, sure enough, uh, he was right. Uh, the injuries started to uh, mount up. Off seasons were spent having surgeries towards the, the end of my career. And at the end of my career, then the surgeries just really mounted and uh, re- really snowballed to the point where I've had 63 orthopedic operations. Um, I had a right knee uh, replacement that went didn't go well. They had to take it out. I had no knee at all. I was put in a leg cast for a year. Then they took the cast off, put a titanium rod in that leg, and my leg was sticking straight out, so I couldn't even sit in the car. Oh, wow. And then finally, I had to make the decision to cut my leg off. Uh, that was my decision. So now we go to, let me just get over here. And that was your first leg, right? That That was was my first leg, yeah. There's more to come. (laughs) There's more to this story. There's more to this story. So having my right leg taken off, that was, um, like I said, that was my decision. And uh, the only deal I had with the doctor was I wanted to be admitted into the hospital the day before the surgery 
And as soon as I hit the bed, I wanted to be doped up. I, I didn't want to second guess myself. I didn't want to that night look at the ceiling and say, what am I doing? What am I doing? And they did exactly that. They got me in there 24 hours before, doped me up. And um, it's funny, with all the surgeries I ever had, especially on my legs, um, after the surgery, I'd wake up in recovery and I would feel with my hand down on the blanket over me to see if they put a cast on or did they put a brace on my leg or just a bandage. And after the surgery, when I went down, the blanket was flat. There was oh, nothing God. there. Yeah. And that's when reality hit me. I said, oh, God, did, did I make the right decision here or whatever? So, um, again, having an athletic identity, I had to set goals. I wasn't going to just, you know, lay, lay in bed all day with one leg. So um, I took up uh, indoor rowing. And I had, uh, I was very successful with that. I, I, I uh, up in Boston at the World Championships, I came in second place. And from there, they flew me to the uh, Paralympic facility in Oklahoma City, where I trained for a week there to make the team. Oh, wow. And uh, I didn't make the team, but I'm glad I didn't because the best part of that trip was I was in the skull or the boat, the skull, with seven other individuals. And the guy in the front of the boat was totally blind. The guy behind him is missing an arm. The guy behind him is missing a hand. I'm missing a leg. He's missing a foot down the line. And here we are, the eight of us, rowing down the Oklahoma River. And I thought, that, you know, I've played sports. I've been around. I traveled. But I had never experienced anything like that at all. I mean, it, it, it was just so motivating and so inspirational. The first morning workout I didn't know the guy in the front of the boat was blind. <laughs> so wow. Didn't know at all. And not only were these people adapting themselves to the boat, but the manufacturer of the boat and the oars and stuff, they adapted the equipment to go with a person's disability. Huh. So, you know, if you were missing an arm, the oar would have a special sling or an attachment where the arm would be attached to the oar because you couldn't grab the oar, mm -hmm. um, things like that. And so that got me thinking, I said, more people have to know about this. I mean, I've watched the Paralympic games before and stuff like that, but I never really up close gave it any thought. So I was so motivated and inspired by it. Um, as soon as I got home, I, I had a master's degree at the time. I said, I I'm going to go back to college and uh, I'm going to get my doctoral degree, but I'm writing my dissertation about the well-being of uh, disabled people in the rowing world. Uh, and, th and that's what I did. And um, it, it, they accepted it. And I, paid, you know, I earned a doctoral degree from it. That's great. But I'll, I'll never forget that experience. So now... I'm living life with missing my one leg. I, I had a prosthetic on that leg and I was able to drive a car with my left foot. Okay. And actually my left foot was turned on its side where it was really unsafe for me to drive because my, my foot wasn't flat on the pedals. It was sideways on the gas and mm. sideways, you know, when I went to the brake. So it was really not safe, but I, I still was able to get out of the house and drive. Um, and, and wore a prosthetic. So act three of the play is now I'm losing my other leg. Um, I woke up on a Monday morning with 102 temperature and I had it till Wednesday morning, about one o'clock in the morning. I was still at 102 and I couldn't move my left leg at all. Couldn't move it. I had an artificial knee in that leg. And just, I could not lift it up. It was so painful. I was screaming. Ambulance comes, takes me to Duke University Medical Center. And uh, they take a uh, blood and fluid samples at, at, off the knee. And they said, we're going to check your white blood cell count. And you have to be between, you should be between zero and 3,000. And they come back a half hour later and I was at 45,000. Oh, wow. And I said, you mean 4,500? And he goes, it's down 45,000. And I'm looking at him and I said, well, what does that mean? 
And the guy didn't say a word to me, he just kept looking at me. And I said, <laughs> again, what does that mean? He goes, you're going to have to make a decision. I said, what decision? He goes, you're going to have to have your leg taken off. I said, wow. you got to be kidding me. Oh, wow. So the first one I planned, I was mentally prepared for. This one I was not. But I thought to myself, okay, I adjusted the missing one leg. I, I can adapt to two legs. Not a problem. Not a problem. And, um, yeah, it's, it's two different worlds, <laughs> missing two legs. Uh, it's not even close. Um, I remember... And, you know, that morning feeling uh, after the surgery, feeling on a blanket. Now there was nothing in that bottom half of the bed at all. And um, I remember they, they an ambulance took me home from the hospital about 10 days later on Thanksgiving Eve. And I said, oh, thank God I'm home, you know. And um, the following morning I woke up and I went to sit up in bed. When you don't have legs, you can't, you have no, no anchor, so to, speak, so to speak, to sit up. And I was like a butterball turkey. I'm rolling around in the bed. I, I couldn't sit up. And I thought, and then it, it kind of dawned on me. I said, you know, I'm not even out of bed yet. What else is going to happen? So um, I started to, to and when I, was, when I was at the hospital, and this was, this was one thing that I'll always remember. And, and this is probably what sparked further acts in my so-called play. Uh, after the surgery that night, uh, there was a nurse in my room. And I was still kind of groggy. And the nurse is on the phone with the pharmacy downstairs. And she's having an argument uh, on the phone. <laughs> and all I hear her is saying, you know, how do I know? I, you know, I can't know. I, I can't tell. You know, I can't guess. I can't. So she gets off the phone and I said, what are you arguing about? And they said, well, they want to prescribe you more pain medication, but they need to know your height and weight. And I said, you know, I'm missing both my legs. You know, I was 65, yeah. I was 265. Now I'm missing two legs. And, uh, she went outside to the nurse's station and, and she got a cloth measuring tape that tailors used to use when they you know, measured your inseam of your pants or whatever. And two other nurses came in and I didn't know it at the time, but they all had a bet on how tall I was without my legs, which I thought was kind of cruel. Yeah. And they, and they put, they put the tape, put the tape on the, on my forehead, top of my head. And they went down my body to the stump. And I went from six foot five to four foot 10. Wow. And I was crushed. Yeah. I was crushed. And I just laid there. And, you know, we all have egos. Now, I was never a bragging and boasting ego. But I was proud of being a tall, husky guy. And my balloon was flipped totally. So, you know, I get home. I do the butterball thing. Um, and I devout myself. Um, I'm going to get on I'm walk. And, you know, I'm going to adapt my body to these prosthetics, and I'm going to walk. And I work with the people at Duke. Great people, great people. I had two big computerized prosthetics made, wow. uh, and and they both weighed a ton. Uh, <laughs> they, and um, I wanted to get back up to six or five. And they said, well, before you get up there, you have to start from the beginning. I said, what's the beginning? And they said, well, we're going to put you in stubbies. What's a stubby? Well, it's a socket. that goes obviously over your, your thigh stump. No knee joint and just maybe about a 12 inch rod and a, and a, a, a fake foot. So you, you walk like a robot. You, you're not mm -hmm. bending anything. You're shuffling almost. And you're still four foot ten, baby. Well, you're a little bit taller than that. And but you, I'm, I got a walker, and I'm doing laps around the thing. And it, and it was really painful. It, it was really tough. And every couple of weeks, then um, the the rod on the bottom, so I got a little taller, a little taller. 
And and I got to say, why do they call them stubbies, you know? And, and why do they make them so short? And they said, well, when you fall, you're closer to the ground. You won't get as hurt. And the guy was serious, son. Huh? <laughs> well, that's a great that's a great way to look at it. <laughs> so um, finally, I, I was working with a, my computerized legs that they made, and they, they were so big and so cumbersome. I couldn't buy myself put these legs on. I needed two other people to put because wow. they, they're suction cup, gravity yeah. suction cup, and I needed somebody to kind of pick me up to hold one leg in place because I didn't have the other leg. And that got to be so frustrating and everything else, it, you know, it started to wear on me. At the, at the same time, um, there's a magazine out there, and Michael, the way you found me and how we met is through this magazine. Yep. It's called Living with Amplitude, or just we call it Amplitude. And um, they did different times. And... The, the magazine, Amplitude Magazine, if the magazine Popular Mechanics had a baby with People's Magazine, <laughs> it would be Amplitude. Because <laughs> half of the, the magazine is about the newest tech, technical stuff, the newest prosthetics, knees, hands, joints. And then it, the other half is success stories of people you know, they ran a marathon, you know, with a prosthetic, or they swam, they played the piano, they painted, whatever. So it's a great magazine. Um, they, they did two articles about me, about uh, my doctoral degree, and and my rowing was the other article they wrote, two separate. Uh, they asked me to write an article about the process of, of getting these prosthetics. And um, it, it was called Regaining My Identity. Mm. And, um, you know, I took them through the whole thing. And finally, the article got published and everything else. And the prosthetics were just not working for me. And a nurse finally came up to me and she goes, you know, some people are just, you meant to sit in a wheelchair. You know, if the prosthetics aren't working. And I was putting so much effort into these prosthetics that I was ignoring yeah. all other goals. You know, I was so focused on these legs that just weren't going to work. So she said, hey, there's no shame. There's a, hold on one second. Hold on. Yeah. I'm sorry, my dog Yogi wants to get on the camera here. <laughs> uh, I apologize. Yeah. Um, so she says, there's no shame in this. There's no thing. Maybe you're just meant to be in a wheelchair. So now... After writing this article, it gets published, uh, you know, Eric's on prosthetics, this and that. Now I'm in a wheelchair. And I almost, I, I, there, there was, as much as I was disappointed in a sense, because again, I set a goal. I had this athletic mentality, yeah. you know, to achieve it. And I felt like it was a loss. But the main part of me felt very relieved because I said, you know what, you know, you're killing yourself and yeah. you're not going to do this. Get, get in a chair and, and, and work your life that way. You'll adapt to that. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> so a couple of months later, Amplitude comes back to me and asked me to write another article about what it's like to go from prosthetics back into a wheelchair, mm -hmm. which that was kind of, that was kind of hard to do, but, um, yeah, I wrote the article, and I think it's called uh, "Being a Wheelchair Champion" or whatever. And so now, um, I'm missing two legs, and I'm in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. All right. The the next act in my play is my wife. I guess dealing with a person missing one leg is one thing. Person missing two legs probably is not the most attractive thing in the world. She left the marriage. She's gone. Takes the handicap van, take, takes <laughs> take it with her. Wow. And I'm left in the house with, with my dog, Yogi. Um, so now I have to adapt my house, my environment to me. Instead of me to prosthetics and stuff, now I have to adapt my surroundings um, to me. So I had hardwood floors put in. 
for for the ease of a wheelchair. Um, you know, every, the bathrooms were all modified, a walk-in shower, a scroll-in shower, mm-hmm. um, uh, widened doorways, uh, elevator lifts, stair chair lifts. Uh, the house is totally souped up for a, a person in a wheelchair. Yeah. Um, so you know, now I have to deal with coping uh, and, and, and developing coping skills. Uh, what I can do, what I can't do. Uh, I had to deal with socialization. Mm. Uh, that was the tough thing is because being social with people, you, you thrive off of their input. They give you motivation, especially an athlete. You, 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 you rely on your coaches to, you know, pep you up, you, you, the fans, you know, you need that boost. Um, if you don't have that and you're by yourself, it's hard to get that, that encouragement. Yeah. Uh, very hard. Um, so I had a struggle with that, and and what I found with socialization was, now mind you, to this date, I haven't been out of my house in three years. Mm. I have not left my house. I have no car. I have, I have no way to get out. Um, you know, and for me to get out, I'd have to rent an ambulance uh, place. Yeah. Um, but I found out with socialization that a lot of people want to help or get involved but they don't know how to, they feel like they are offending me. You know, if they say, can I help you? Can I do this? So, you know, I made this thing that I was going to make three phone calls a day. The first phone call, uh, was in the morning called friend, a family member, uh, and, and, uh, just complain about everything. My life sucks. Why me? What was me? Shouldn't have happened. Um, second phone call around noontime, you call another person up and say, um, no, Yogi, you call and uh, say, hey, I need help around the house. Can you come over and change a light bulb or can you run to the store for me? And the third one is at night and you're just socializing. You know, what, how'd you like the ball game last night? Or what do you think about yeah. this? And all right, Yogi. Um, so one, you're getting it out of your system in the morning. Two, you're having something done, and three, you're socializing, and um, I, for me, that helped a great deal. Um, but I had to make that happen because, again, people don't know what to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I was trying to to solve the social aspect, the coping. I was trying to deal with accepting my disability, accepting my surrounding, accepting the whole situation, being by myself. Um, you know, what to do. Um, and then you start to look for areas of motivation and inspiration. And I kept thinking about those guys and the Paralympic team and they inspired the heck out of me. But, you know, I love the movies and there are a lot of movies that I watch, you know, uh, and a lot of sport movies where the underdog comes back out of nowhere and, you know, is successful and, um, so I watch a lot of that, listen to music. Um, I listen to your podcast. Um, and then I listen to certain, or I, I kind of don't steal, but I borrow some people's lines out of speeches that motivate me. And <clears throat> I got three of them. The first one I, I had when I had my first leg amputated, and it's from the movie Rocky Balboa, the last movie. And he says that it ain't about how hard you can hit, it's about how, how hard you can get hit and keep moving forward. How much you can take and keep moving forward. That's how winning is done. And and I adopted that because I thought, you know, you, you're gonna get you're gonna get punched a lot here. So accept it, you know it's coming. It's how you're gonna deal with it. You know, and just, you know, if you fall down, get back up. And if it, I describe myself as an old plow horse, I just put my head down and keep moving forward. You know, <laughs> it may be slow, but I'm going to keep moving forward. So that's, that's one. My, my second one comes from a Jimmy Valvano speech that he gave yeah. on ESPN. Wow. And I, I'm going to read this, so excuse me, because I don't want to get it wrong. He says, to me, there are three things everyone should do every day. Number one is to laugh. 
Number two is to think. Spend some time in thought. Number three, you should have your emotions move you to tears. If you laugh, think, and cry, that's a heck of a day. Wow. And I've done that. Uh, yeah, I cry at, uh, with some of the movies I watch. I get emotional. Yep. Um, you know, I think, I plan, I'm trying to, you know, say how I can make my life better and how I can adapt better. Um, and then I try to, you know, with my dog and stuff, I just try to find time to laugh and things like that. Um, but that is that is like that's one heck of a day. That's a full day, and and I agree with that completely. Yeah. Um. So now you know I'm 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 setting my goals even even today, um, uh, which requires a lot of strategy, a lot of planning. It's a slow process, but but I got it going. Uh, I have a lot of self determination, which which I bring from being an athlete. Um. When I do make my mind up on a goal or whatever, it's, it's going to be hard to stop me. Um, and they said that there, there, there was a, a quote or, or a um, article written out, and they said for people with disabilities, um, their disability is a big factor in their self determination. It's almost a driving point for a person. Interesting. You know, yeah. Um, so anyway, I talked about my house. So I, I've adapted my environment. Um, I'm content with being in a wheelchair. That does not bother me. I miss driving a car. I miss being outside. I miss people, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my goal is one day to get a hand control van. Mm, yeah. But that'll come one day. Um, you know, we we're holding down the fort here, me and Yogi alone. Um, and, and, you know, when you set goals, uh, you, you have to have the, in the effort, the intensity to follow through with it. You have to have the persistence to keep it going and you have to stay focused on the direction that you're taking. And those are the three steps that, uh, that I practice with that. Um, every year they have, uh, the world championship indoor rowing. And, uh, the first time I competed, uh, there were 2,200, it was held up in Boston. There were 2,200 people competing in different groups, men, women, age groups. And then they had disability groups. Uh, at that time I was missing one leg. So I was in the men's one legged, um, uh, division. Um, and, and I came in second, first time I ever competed. I came wow. in second. That's what got me to the Paralympic thing. Um, uh, after I graduated from um, Grand Canyon University with my doctorate, I went back and now I'm missing two legs. And I went back to the world championships again in Boston. And um, I was in the division, no legs, men over 60. I'm 66 years old now. This was a couple of years ago. And uh, the, the, the good news is I came in first. <laughs> the uh, disclaimer that I have is I was the only one in that division. <laughs> so, so, you still came I, in first. I still came. Yeah. So if I don't, I can always leave that other half out, but uh, <laughs> just, just to be fair and honest. Um, but, you know, my, my, my purpose there was uh, not so much for me, but I wanted to show other people with disabilities and stuff that you can do this. I mean, you can do this. Uh you know, the machines, the rowing machines can be adapted towards your disability. There are people to help you. Um, you, you can train at home. You can do races over the, they, they hook you up on the uh, internet wow. and you can do races from your own house with That's other people. Cool. So, um, I, I'd like to do that one more time. Yeah. Um, we'll see. Uh, I have a question for you because, sure. and, and this has to do with something we talked about uh, before we actually went on air, and I don't think it's part of your the notes that we wanted to go over, but uh, it's something that I went through, you know, from from the youngest age, and it, it's the, the the difficulty in an amputee or somebody missing a limb finding a job that is extremely difficult, and I know that's something you've been going through. Do you want to speak on that at all? I don't want to put you on the spot, but that's no, a, you're not not put, I'm totally frustrated. I thought having a master's degree, a doctoral degree, um, 
and th there's avenues I hate to play the disability card, but I thought that, no problem getting remote work from home. And especially after the uh, um, uh, pandemic there we had, yeah. um, everybody was working from home. Yeah. So I said, no problem. Well, that, that's dried up. All of the disability sites I've gone on, they just referenced me to another site, to another site, to another site. All of the uh, internet uh, things uh, like Indeed, FlexJobs, all the others, everybody wants uh, you know a sign-up fee. It's all about them making money or clicks. I, I've got no response, nothing. I applied to 39 colleges for teaching, wow. nothing. Um, you know, I, I'm at the point, the only flex uh, remote jobs that I found, which I don't apply to, is uh, IT jobs and uh, tax accountant jobs. Other than that, forget about it. Um, you know, I, <laughs> you know I, don't, I don't even know what to do anymore. I've called some places a couple of times over, you know, with a couple of months in between the telephone calls. Uh, I send emails, introduction letters, yeah. resumes. Uh, I cannot find a job. And I'm not looking to make a zillion bucks. You know, I'm just trying to pay the bills here. I'm on a disability check, but I need some extra money to pay sure. extra bills. And you're um, willing to work, too. That's the I thing. I want to work. Yep. I'm, yep. I'm fully equipped at home. I have computers. Yep. I have printers. I have everything here. Yep. Uh, and, and I don't sleep at all. So, I mean, I, I can work 18 <laughs> hours a day. It wouldn't bother me at all. But I, I'm totally astounded that I cannot find a job. Uh, I'm, I, it just blows me away. And, and the only job I refuse, uh, maybe some people say in the audience, yeah, I could get a job with customer service answering telephones. But you know what? I got my own problems. I, I, I To me, getting on the phone and somebody start complaining that, uh, you know, they, they left this string out of their kite kit, uh, I would just go... I can't do this. Yeah, not only that, I don't think, I mean, that's not what people like us are all about either, right? We deserve opportunities like anyone else. And that's, I, I don't blame you for not having those kind of jobs. Not to say there's anything wrong with people that do it, but it's just, right. you know what? You, you've got your doctorate and you have years of experience and you should have many opportunities. Yeah, you know, I, I have, you know, the academic experience, but I have the streetwise, you yeah. know, the school of hard knocks. And, and yeah. You know, that goes, I, I worked 30 years in project management in on nuclear plants and FAA wow. facilities around the country. Wow. And, I, you, know, you know, it's it's, uh, rock, uh, it's the uh, Sylvester Stallone first blood movie. You can't even get a job parking cars. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it's very, very frustrating. It, it, it's demoralizing. Uh, I did, I shared with you... Uh, uh, a, a young lady from uh, Grand Canyon University uh, writing her dissertation for a doctorate degree. That's great. Uh, to do that, you you have a panel of three people, a uh, chairperson, methodologist, and a content expert that, that take you through that whole process to help you guide you along. And uh, she saw a couple of videos about me, and, and I was on a list in, at Grand Canyon and she asked if I would be a content expert for a dissertation. I agreed to do that. I mean, it's no no pay or anything, but you know, it'll be several months to do it. But I, I'd be glad to help. Uh, it's a, it's a it's a when you write a dissertation, the one word that you want stricken from the English dictionary is revision, because <laughs> all you do is they they grind you down with revision after revision after revision. Uh, you just hate the word. You know, you just cringe when you hear it. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I felt good about it, but it's, it's still, I still need a job, yeah. but you know, it, it just made me feel good. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It sounds kind of uh, soupy or soapy, but it, it felt like <clears throat> I was wanted, uh, you know, it felt like, uh, you know, I was needed for something. Which no, I, I think it's fantastic. I mean, you're, you're I helping felt like that in a long time. I think it's, I think it's a great opportunity and you're helping someone else. And it, it, to me, it's more than anything else. It says the type of person you are, and that's why you need, you, I think you deserve an opportunity somewhere else. Yeah, I mean, anybody out there, um, please yeah. call. I'm in the book, I'm on the internet, uh, call. Speaking um, of a book, didn't you, you were writing a book, if I'm not mistaken. I, I finished my book. It's called okay. Gabriel's Row on the Wings of Angels. And, and it talks about 
going through my entire life and and I believe and, and I grew up Catholic and I had a I had a bad experience in church mm. uh, with getting hit by nuns and stuff mm. and I and I walked away from the whole thing and uh, when I had my first leg taken off uh, I was, obviously I was in the house I was depressed and the neighbor came over and they said, you know, we got to get you out of the house. You got to socialize. And I said, what do you think? Of, where am I going to socialize? What would I get? And he goes, uh, I, I, I want to take you to church. And the New Yorker came out of me. It was like, no effing way. Am I like, no way, no way, no way. I was really no way. <laughs> and a month goes by and I'm still trapped in the house here. You know, this is the first like. So I called him up and I, and I said, uh, the, does that offer still stand? And he goes, what, what offer? And I said, that church thing you were talking about. And he goes, yeah. He goes, as a matter of fact, on Saturdays, they have a, a men's breakfast uh, thing where, you know, 30 guys from church get together. They have a breakfast at the church. Uh, everybody's cooking and, they, you know, they, they go over what's new and, you know, it's nothing heavy. And I, and I started to go to that. And I, I gave a, a, I used to belong to Toastmasters. I gave a couple of speeches there and my so-called story. And um, I, get, I got baptized there. And uh, every Tuesday morning via Zoom, I attend a Bible study class with them. And, uh, and every two months or so, a group of the guys, and they're older than I am, come over to my house now and, and do minor chores, change light bulbs, you know, stuff I can't reach. That's great. Yeah. Um, th that's the extent of the socialization of that now. Um, but uh, I, I, I have, I don't want to forget this, Michael. No, please bring up whatever you'd like. When, when, when I started at Grand Canyon, okay, uh, fantastic school. I, re I really uh, applaud them. They're, they're fantastic. Um, part of the orientation on one of the courses uh, I took, um, they had they had us view this uh, YouTube video of a of a professor at uh, Virginia College, Virginia University, and he was dying of pan pancreatic cancer. And his name is Randy Porsche, P A U. S H P A U S H Randy. And, and his speech is about time management and, and what they were trying to drive home with his speech. Now his speech was time management. He's dying. So what do you wow. do? What do you say? What do you do in the time that you have left? What Grand Canyon university was trying to do or the point they were getting across was when, when you, when you work on a, a dissertation or your doctoral degree, you, you have to really have control of your time. Uh, you know, on the weekends, if the family wants to have a barbecue or go to the beach, you have to say, no, I got schoolwork. And you know, at nighttime, you got schoolwork. You, you have to be so disciplined because it that does take a lot of time and a lot of revisions, a lot of everything. So, they tried to put a spin on it where, you know, talking about time management, what you do with time. And, and his speech was about time that he had left. And I thought it was amazing that here's a fella that has a couple of months to live. Instead of being on a beach with his family, instead of traveling, instead of doing something, he's giving a speech to college students. And I, and I thought it was remarkable. But he had... He had a quote, I'm going to miss one too, right? but it, it, it's a not what he said was a novel way of looking at obstacles. And I, and I took that and then I applied that to my other motivational uh, sayings that I grabbed. He said, the brick walls are there for a reason. The brick walls are not there to keep us out. The brick walls are there to give us a chance to show how badly we want something. Wow. And so God bless the guy. I mean, he passed away. He, he was 47 years old. Oh, 
Wow. So, you know, puts things in perspective. It sure does. But it's just amazing what he had left in his life. He, he was donating it to talking with people. I thought it was amazing. So, so for me, you know, I, I draw my motivation and inspiration from a lot of different spots, from, from real people to um, people on the movie screen, to yeah. people on records, and people at books. Um, you take it where you can get it, you know? Um, top top three movies. Three was the one, and that's not inspirational. But I used what? to do a shark fishing when I grew up. Jaws. Oh, he's, Jaws, okay. Okay, not inspirational, but I used to do shark fishing when I lived on Long Island. So okay, here and there. But the other two um, is the movie The Natural with yep. Robert Redford. Yep. And the movie Hoosiers. Basketball. Oh, Gene Hackman. <laughs> Those two movies, they inspire me. Underdogs, you know, coming back. Well, those are definitely two great choices. <laughs> so, but, um, but yeah, so that's about it. Uh, so if anybody knows uh, any work out there. <laughs> and I'll make sure I, in the description, oh, I always put your, your website. Uh, but any other way that people, if they are listening, you'd like them to contact you? Is there... You can contact me via email. You have my email address. Sure. Uh, you have my phone number. I mean, it's all, it's, it, you know, I, it's, it, nothing's unlisted. Okay. Uh, but I, I found trying to find somebody's phone number on the internet. It, it, again, you have to pay for that too. <laughs> yeah. I remember it used to come in that book that we used to keep the doors open with back in the day, yeah, right? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah I don't think you, you feel sorry for those people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. any, any, anything else you'd like to share? I, you know, I, I I'm, we we have nothing but time. If you'd like to share anything else, any maybe somebody else is going through a very similar journey as you're going through. Is there anything you'd like to share? One of the, one of the things, you know, although I work out and I row every morning and, and I, I lift weights after I row, but sitting in a wheelchair, I, I got to get on some type of diet. So I've been looking for a diet because um, I'm not burning any calories really, uh, mm. you know, walking or, or, yeah. or anything like that. So trying to work on that. The job is a number one importance. Yeah, and if anyone knows of any opportunities, let Eric yeah. know through me, through Eric. Uh, I'll have, the, like I said, I'll have the email in the description. I could say it if you'd like to. It's up to you on the email address. You know, like, whatever you feel best. I mean, you, 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 you. I'll have to. Let me see if I can find it. It is Gabriel dot Eric forty two at gmail.com and there you go yeah, yeah I made sure I had it up here I wanted to... <laughs> We're yeah, talking... and, and, and anybody that calls me will be my first customer service phone call <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah don't even say who you are just start complaining about something you toast <laughs> the toaster <laughs> yeah, yeah the toaster that's good <laughs> well excellent uh Again, I'll, I'll leave the floor up to you. However, you want to end it. You want to anything else you want to say, or, or... no? I, th I think you do a great job, a great service, and like I said, you're you're part of my socialization um, group. I look forward to. Yeah, and I want to say this too. I mean, I we, we met each other. What? Gosh, uh, I don't know. Let's say a year ago, it might be a little less, but now I consider you a friend, and we get to talk, and and we have this little circle of friends that we get to talk, and and I, and I really enjoy that. I, I I started volunteering my time for bowling, so my the timing is going to be a little off, but we'll get that going again. I mean, it's fun yeah. being able to do that. And it's always great catching up to you, even though it sounds like we haven't caught up since the last episode that we were on together. We've talked quite a bit. And again, I consider you a friend and I thank you yeah. so much for everything you've done for me. And, and I thank you for your time today. No, I thank you. You provide a great uh, service and vehicle for people to get together. Um, and like I said, a lot of people don't know how to approach uh, people with a disability or an amputation or whatever. And uh, we're accessible. <laughs> I'm be I, I beg for conversation. So, uh, but uh, no, I, I love your podcast. I think you're great. And uh, I can't wait to finally meet you in person. One day. Yeah, that's what we got to do for sure. Well, when I throw out the first pitch at the uh, Diamondbacks game. Yeah, do it. Let me know when you do that. Yeah, we'll, we'll have to get. <laughs> if, if somebody from the Diamondbacks are listening, call me. <laughs>
Yeah, so, I'd like that's on my bucket list to do is uh, the Boston Marathon in a speed wheelchair and uh, throw out a first pitch at a Major League Baseball game and get a job. Jobs first, but the, those two things. So I still have goals to do. Absolutely, I know you do. Uh, but thanks for your time today. I appreciate you and I appreciate your audience and everybody have a wonderful weekend. Memorial Day weekend. Please have a great weekend. Come back. Stump Podcast, hosted by Mike Bowler. If you want to be a guest on the program, reach out to Mike at his email address, mike at mikebowler.com. This podcast is produced by One Hand Man Productions. If you are looking to start your podcast, go to onehandmanproductions.com.